and I'm not making progress. And that, that I find kind of drives me crazy. So um, I would advocate, especially in the application of these things, to just, you know, perfect is the enemy of good enough, try something. Just do it fast. See if it works. If it's working, keep going. As soon as it fails, dump it. Try something else. I'm a huge proponent of doing it iteratively and doing it quickly. And then once you understand what's going on and how it works, you can always take a pause and then, you know, port it to something higher resolution that really answers the mail. But at that point, you know what it needs to do. And so it's much faster, much easier, and much more likely to be done correctly. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, is this uh, word prediction on uh, slide 20. Lots and lots of folks on the applied side want the application because they want things to be predictive. They want to know what's going to happen. And as uh, I'm sure we've all been bitten by this, when you make, <laughs> when you make predictions about social systems, well, I should say, when I make predictions about social systems, I typically get bitten pretty hard. Uh, by that because social systems do all kinds of crazy stuff and there's inevitably some sort of something in your model or that isn't in your model that has some sort of an impact at some point so I, you know I understand the desire for prediction I like to try to term it more like forecasting and so given this model given our understanding of this system given how we think things are going to go in the future, these are the sorts of outcomes we would expect to see. And of these outcomes, this one is the most likely, this one's second most likely, and so on. And then you can start to layer in more information to make it more useful from a decision support perspective by saying, you know, not only is this the most likely outcome, this is the trajectory that you'll be on to get there. And so you can get a sense of, am I actually headed there? This other outcome has this other trajectory. And so again, you can be taking measurements over time to try to understand which trajectory you're on, which forecasted outcome is likely to occur in the real world. And so saying prediction is very difficult, if not you know, more or less impossible in social systems, doesn't mean you can't make relevant statements about their basically they're, they're the evolution they're going to make through time. It just means you have to do it correctly. And again, that's not something that all folks are used to. If they're used to op, you know, systems that can be optimized, they're expecting to hear it's going to take six months and you're going to need eight of these things and they're going to be utilized 85% of the time, which means one's going to run out or you know, wear out, and so you need, you need to have a one in backup, and then you're good. You know, and social systems don't behave quite that cleanly most of the time, and so it's a little different, but again, it can be done in a way that, will, that, that can still be useful for the decision, from a decision support perspective. Okay, now we're going to zoom in a little bit more on a bit of the nitty gritty here. And then um, after I bore you with some of these details, we'll get into some examples that will hopefully be a bit more interesting. So models. I've been talking a lot about sort of gener generics um, that we, uh, we like to leverage computation and do this and that. Um, again, I'm a huge proponent of models in the space. I think it helps you understand and think through what the generating mechanisms might be helps you understand what data you ought to be looking at. And so now I'm going to focus a little bit more on how to actually use these models. Uh, first off, I mean, I, I think in this, I, I suspect I'm preaching to the, uh, to the choir here. You know, the, the universe just isn't simple enough to not require a model. Uh, so you got to leave some stuff out. And, you know, reasonable people can differ on where you get to draw that line. But the point is the line has to be drawn. And societies are messy, heterogeneous, path dependent. Drawing that line is tough, and it's going to have an impact. There's no way around it. And humans are just a train wreck, right? I mean, they learn, they make bad decisions, they are stubborn, 
they have the, the audacity to die occasionally and be replaced by a different kind of human that might make different decisions and screw things up further. And so, except in the most trivial cases, I would argue one of the most efficient ways, well, and it's not just me, right, and Buss et al. wrote a nice paper on this. Um, one of the most efficient ways to understand that is uh, to simulate it, to actually write down what you think the generating mechanisms are and spin it forward through time and see if you were right. And again, that doesn't prove it. It's just a sufficiency theorem, but it's a good start. So I would argue that we can paraphrase Box, um, George Box, uh, by saying, you know, you know, some models, all models are wrong, some models are useful, his you know, famous quote that we all love to live by, at least I do, since I, I like being wrong. Um, I would argue that not only are some models useful, but they're also critical to our understanding. So how does this fit together? Um, slide 23 shows my worldview on how this all fits together. So each run of your model is a strict deduction. And then what you want to do is run these models a bunch of times. So you've got the, here on the left of this diagram, you're, you're building the scenario. So you're, you know, <laughs> it's the Kohler failure loop, so to speak. Um, you're trying different things until it all works out. You get it the way you want it. Now you port it into uh, a more scalable, higher performance system, say, you dump it on some big iron, you run it a whole bunch of times, and you collect, say, 60,000 strict deductions of your model, right? You run it once with a random seed that you understand, an input that you've collected, and you get some output. Now you take all those strict deductions, and you can do inductive inference across them to try to make statements, you know, more sort of general statements about a class of things. And then if you're really lucky, that's to solve abductive questions. And actually, that'll be the first example I talk about in just a couple of minutes. Because uh, I'm a huge fan of, of, of sort of the abductive business. I, 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 like, I like sort of bringing order to things that seem chaotic. The other important component here is that your model should produce classes of output. Um, a whole bunch of stuff that's essentially more or less boring. And so, you know, things that, you know, well, that's obvious. I didn't need a model to tell me that. Okay, great. But the nice thing is that means your model isn't doing something completely outlandish. Then there should be some invalid output from your model, say corner cases, and things that, again, you should expect to see. You know, I know that if I set this parameter all the way over here, things are going to wig out. And look, they wigged out. Excellent. You know, that's breaking your model, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to understand how your model will fail, so you'll know when it does. So then there are two other kinds of output, these unexpected outcomes. These are surprising outcomes. Some of them are going to be valid. Some of them are going to be invalid. And so the more you understand your model, the cleaner you're going to be able to differentiate between those two classes of unexpected outcome. Because the unexpected valid outcome, that's where the new insights come in. That's what's so important. That's why you're running your model, is to generate those kinds of output. Because now you're increasing the amount of information you have about the system, in theory. OK. So now what? How do we actually use these sorts of things in the real world? I mean, this is all. I mean, this works anywhere for any kind of model-based science. Uh, going on to slide 24, we can get into the really boring stuff. And I promise this is only a few slides. Um, so uh, blah, 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 blah. I think I've covered a lot of this. Now, the, the again, I work for a federally, I work for a not-for-profit that operates seven federally funded research and development centers, or FFRDCs. Um, so, when it comes to simulations, we live and die by this process called VVNA, verification, validation, and accreditation. And that grew out of the DOD, largely. And as I said before, that's a mixed blessing. It's nice because they have a rich history of this. They're used to thinking about these sorts of things. It can be a little painful because it all grew up around systems that could be optimized or that were physics-based, and you could do experiments. To understand. So, for example, uh, let's say you're you've got you, you've got a mortar, and it's expensive to fire the thing a whole lot, and so you want to build a simulation of firing it, so you can do it more cheaply. 
and add it to other models and blah, blah, blah. So you build your simulation, you know, parabolic flights, and, you know, an initial velocity and things. And so you run it and says, okay, it, under these conditions, the projectile will, will land within a circular error probability of X at this distance. Did you do it right? Well, that's easy enough to find out. You can go out to the field and you can, you know, replicate essentially what you simulate. If you got it wrong, you can go back and think, okay, well, maybe friction. The projectile's friction with the air needs to be added. So you can add that. I'm like, well, it worked okay. But you know what? It was gusty today, and so it actually drifted a fair amount while it was in flight. We need to add wind. And so you can see where I'm headed with this, right? We're adding more and more and more detail to make the simulation more and more accurate. And we're doing it by experimentation in the real world. That doesn't necessarily translate so well to the social uh, system. Um, there are some classic examples of people trying this and getting into a lot of trouble. Um, it can be unethical. It can be too expensive, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so that has created some unique challenges for bringing simulations of social systems into certain arenas. If we move on, we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit. Oh, I should say, it turns out you can get a beanie with VVNA on it. I had no idea that VVNA had made such an impression in popular culture. Um, so uh, for all of you out there that are deeply committed to VVNA, there is a beanie with your name on it. Okay, verification. This is just a, a horrible, awful thing, but it's very, very important. Um, it starts with having a detailed formulation, and that is essentially a non-technical, well, a non-coded narrative that explains in detail what your simulation is going to do. So verify, did you build the model correctly? That's easier if you've got something that says what it should do. That's what your formulation is. And there have been some projects where I have literally taken a 20-page document that you know explains in detail what the model is supposed to do. I've put every single sentence of that document into a table, and then I have cut and pasted code into the adjacent cells of the table to show where that sentence is in the code. That was a couple weeks of my life that I'm never getting back. Um, and it, it, it was painful. But by the same token, we could very clearly now show how we translated a narrative into code. And it exposed all of the assumptions. It showed what we forgot, all that jazz. It was actually very useful. If we go on to the next slide. Validation is, did you build the correct model? This is a little trickier, because now you need some sort of referent against which to test. That's a little tricky. Um, because the social system you might be simulating may not exist, we may not have enough data about it to do the, uh, the comparison, all that jazz. There are any, you know, the myriad problems that could come up here. So how have we gotten around this? So what we've done is put a couple of things from the literature together into a framework that lets us try to figure out how much effort to put into this. So on the next slide, the two basic uh, papers are the, the Axtel et al. 95 paper on docking and the Axtel 2005 paper on levels of empirical validity. And again, I am coming at this from an ABM bias, so just FYI. So basically docking, that was a paper about how to you know, compare two different models. And, and I'll stress that two different models. <laughs> it's big and round, sorry. Um, uh, so there are three, they said there are three basic classes here. You've got identity, where the, the two models create ind literally indistinguishable results. Distributional, where the two models create statistically indistinguishable results, but you know, the numbers are not identical. And then there's relational, where the two models create statistically distinguishable results, but they show similar relational changes, you know, basically inputs to output. So if you increase this parameter in this model that increases this other output, and you see the same thing in the second model, but the differences are statistically distinct. And then on the empirical validity, oh, empirical validity side, um, we, we found this to be particularly useful. Level zero means essentially your agents, again, agent bias, um, 
have qualitative correspondence to the real world. They behave logically for what they're trying to represent. Level one, you've got macro level qualitative correspondence. So let's say, you know, the real world, what, uh, wealth is zip distributed. And in my simulation, wealth is, is a skewed distribution, but it's not necessarily scale free. Uh, level two, macro level quantitative correspondence. So that means if the real world, this quantity is zip distributed, it is zip distributed in my simulation as well. And last but not least, level three is micro level quantitative correspondence, which basically means you've got a one-to-one -one mapping between entities that you're modeling and entities in your simulation. And you can pretty much say this one is that one. Obviously, level three is more of a theoretic construct. Although with all of these staggering amounts of data being generated by humans all the time, um, without apparently regard to anything, uh, it's getting more and more likely. Okay, so moving on. Um, so when we, we put all this together, let's just, one more slide. We'll, we'll go back to a picture. This is a lot of text, and text is awful. Um, here's how we conceptualize this. So what is it we're trying to do? Is it a thought experiment, or are we just trying to kind of figure out the bounds of the problem? In that case, we're really just looking for relational correspondence between the simulation and the real world. And that is pretty much you know, level zero kind of thing. You know, are our agents behaving normal, you know, plausibly for agents in this situation? And you know, does it basically seem like the real world? We can use that to start to understand the problem, start to get a sense of what the requirements might be. Now, if we're going to be sort of trying to understand the generating mechanisms, maybe even doing some coarse grain forecasting, starting to get into a functional analysis or even, say, synthesis, now we want to get to be distributional. We want to make sure that our model is actually generating things that are statistically similar to the real world. And again, so that puts us into level one, level two. So macro level correspondence, you know, whether qualitative or quantitative, we're at least, we're getting in the ballpark now. And then finally, if we're trying to get into the fine grain forecasting or trying to figure out sort of how to be, how to start doing some physical verification, so actual like field experiments and that sort of thing, now we want to try to get to be identity. You know, we, we want the simulation to be indistinguishable from the real world and level three. And again, like I said, that's essentially a theoretical concept. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, being able to get the pieces of this. So next slide, um, just to, as by the way of setting up for the second example, down here at the bottom, this level three identity, physical verification, fine grain forecasting, blah, blah, blah. Um, obviously hard to do and really difficult as I've been, you know, sort of yammering about for quite a while now, very tough to do for social systems. By the same token, we're pretty good at it when it comes to physical systems. And so that's where this idea of multi-resolution comes in. And we'll talk a little bit about that in my second example. Um, and again, so at least in our experience, there hasn't been any issue with mixing resolutions in a simulation. Uh, it causes trouble. You know, time scales can be very different and trying to map something that runs at, you know, a nanosecond time scale into a social simulation that, that's like the day time scale can be awful, but it can be done. And so you can have these mixed resolution models. You have to do it very carefully. And you can't let the higher resolution part drive your application. So, you know, a sensor might be, you know, modeled down to the photon level, just to pick something out of a hat at random that we won't see in the second example. Um, but the social dynamics around that sensor might be at a much lower resolution, you know, potentially level one or level zero. So don't let the fact that the physics in the sensor model are really great make you think that the overall system can be used for fine grain forecasting or physical you know, verification and blah, 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 blah. Be conservative when you start mixing resolutions. Okay, now let's move on to a couple of examples. I've talked sort of theoretically here quite a bit. Um, 
let's uh, we're going to finish things off with two examples. Uh, one that's pretty strictly social, and one that mixes social and uh, physics. So the first example is uh, basically: Are legal systems any good at actually solving problems? Uh, this is uh, there's an awesome little diagram on slide 32 about this. Um, and basically, the, uh, the abductive uh, question here on the next slide is um, there's this whole body of jurisprudential literature, and I should say I'm going to use the term jurisprudential and jurisprude as much as I can because of two of my favorite terms. Um, so there's a huge body of jurisprudential literature that says common law should evolve to states of greater efficiency. Um, that's, I will, I will say that is vaguely defined in the literature, but greater efficiency, essentially no matter what. So judges could be very rational, very reasoned, and, and think really hard about every case in front of them and make the better decision. And so, okay, that increases the efficiency. By the same token, in theory, judges could behave randomly and the system should still evolve to state the greater efficiency because core laws will be litigated more often. And so you get more bites of that rotten apple and eventually you get it right and then it stops being litigated or at least its probability of being litigated goes down. So that's all well and good, right? I mean, there are thousands of pages of rich narrative that argue this up and down. So then, Three, three, three guys led by a dude named Niblet uh, actually dug up a data set that would let them test this. And God bless them, because uh, that would not have been trivial. Well, actually, I suppose God bless their students, because that would not have been trivial. Um, and what they found was no evidence whatsoever that this actually happened. As far as they could tell, it was a random walk. <laughs> so interesting. Um, so who's right? The logic of the jurisprudence, yay, <laughs> we, should, we should have these things at night and we could turn it into a drinking game. Um, the, uh, the jurisprudential literature says this should happen and the logic is compelling and yet the evidence seems to say something else is going on. So going on to the next slide, we can start to formulate this as a way we can um, actually use computational social science to go after. So is this a shelling-like problem? I, I, I'm sure we're all familiar with shelling, right? And, and looking at uh, the, the uh, social, uh, so the um, sociological, here we go, um, evidence back in the 60s, you know, folks were interviewing uh, each other, no, not each other, but, you know, residents in cities and, and getting sort of the sense that people wanted to live in integrated neighborhoods. But the settlement patterns would say otherwise. And so his question was, could both signals be correct? And so you've got the shelling segregation model where he showed that uh, folks with even very mild preferences for wanting just a minority of their neighbors to be like them, if they weren't coordinating their movements, would end up in a very much more segregated system. And so my thought was, is that the same thing we're, we're seeing here? Could judicial systems simultaneously evolve to states of higher efficiency and yet emit signals to the contrary? So uh, what did I do? So moving on to slide 34, I developed a computational social science approach to try to answer this question. Um, so basically current techniques, like I said, right, philosophical or game theoretic, the logic is sound, but again, we've got this disconnect. And so the issue that I saw, you know, humans are messy, I've already said that. And the other problem is that, you know, Game theory and, and other techniques work really well for, say, an N of 2 or an N of N. Um, and they start to have some trouble in, the, in that creamy middle part, which is where this problem lies. Because we don't, you know, there are a few hundred judges, a few thousand if you go into, say, state courts and things, too. So I thought an agent-based model seemed like the perfect solution. Uh, again, of course, I'm biased. So no matter what this problem was, it was going to be an agent-based solution. Uh, so going on to the next slide, uh, what we needed to do was represent the relevant entities. So in this particular case, the judges had to represent the interconnections. That was the social, the organizational, and the spatial. You know, so we've got jurisdictions. We've got a formal hierarchical structure in the uh, 
courts, and then we've got a social network of judges. You know, they, they like each other in different ways. And we need to represent the system drivers, which in this case are the cases. Um, something well, uh, not unique, but at least an important component of the U.S. federal system or U.S. federal judicial system is the cases and controversies clause. The uh, courts can only uh, think about actual cases or controversies before them. They can't, you know, say, see something going on in society and say, that's something I'd like to espouse upon. And so and then go and talk about it and, and have a ruling, so to speak. They have to, two people have to actually come before them and say, we are pissed about this. You need to fix this. Going on to the next slide. So how did I uh, do this? Uh, in order to give the system a, uh, a right and wrong answer, because you know this is about evolving to more efficient states, uh, what I did was I, I used the de Young test set, which is a set of these five minimization problems that range from find the bottom of this bowl, which is tough not to do, uh, to basically try to find the deepest foxhole um, there's a bunch of them, and only one is slightly deeper than all the others. And so they get progressively more difficult for heuristic search to find. Um, and so that is essentially how I was going to measure the, uh, the evolution. Going on to the next slide, I created the Article Three Federal Courts. Um, this is their hierarchical structure of the courts. We're running out of time, so I'm going to start speeding up a little bit. Uh, it's the district courts are on the periphery here. Then you've got the appellate courts in the middle and the Supreme Court or in the sort of central part and then the Supreme Court dead center middle. In the next slide, I downloaded all of the biographical information of the justices and then did a little bit of sort of who went to which schools at what years, what courts have they been on at what times and used that information to develop a uh, social network among the judges because there are two kinds of cases they need to pay attention to. There's a controlling precedent. So a, a court that's higher up the food chain than you, when it decides something, you need to follow that, you know, stare decisis, let the case stand. Um, but then there's also um, informative precedent, so to speak. So how did other jurisdictions decide this? It's not uh, something that is gonna control my decision-making, but it's something that can persuade me to go one way or the other. And that's where the social network part came in. Uh, next slide, I use jurisdictions that I just mapped onto a torus because, of course, I use NetLogo like everybody. Uh, next slide, the basic dynamics. Uh, cases would come before the judges. The bigger the difference in the case, it, you know, basically, was this, did this help minimize the problem or not? The bigger that minimization improvement would be, the more likely the judge was to find for that particular solution to the case. And then that would percolate up because there is some probability of it being uh, appealed. The judges also wanted to have a similar geospatial because this was mapped into a space. They want to have a consistent spatial sense of what the solution should be. So essentially they, they have a, I would argue that it's sort of akin to them having a political stance. And so they want to be, you know, strict constructionists or activists, whatever it is. They want to be more consistent. They don't want to be a strict constructionist strict constructionist in some cases and an active judge in others. And then they also wanted to be conformative. So they also, they had a social network. They didn't want to deviate too far from that. Next slide. So did it work well? It actually worked surprisingly well. The uh, This judicial system did a pretty good job of finding the minimization solution. And what I thought was even more amazing, I put them up against a genetic algorithm and a particle form optimization and they didn't do half bad. So it turns out judicial systems aren't a bad way to solve problems, at least, you know, in this highly stylized sense. Now, what about this niblet business? On the next slide, uh, what was very interesting, uh, disregard the stuff on the left, uh, we'll just focus on the right and get on with our lives. Um, on the right here is essentially the, the, the solution, the current best solution in the system. And what you can see is that it undergoes punctuated equilibrium. And that is exacerbated by appeals and by precedential control. So if someone above you makes a boneheaded decision, suddenly you're on the hook to make boneheaded decisions too. And it takes a little while for the judge to say, okay, no, this is ridiculous. We got to revisit this. 
and try to come up with something better. And occasionally, say, the Supreme Court will make a really, really good decision, and the whole system suddenly gets much better. And so then it starts to do a, a random walk. And so what you can see here is that because of these punctuated equilibrium dynamics, it's not hard at all to imagine Niblet at all grabbing a finite chunk of that data and showing that it's actually getting worse because it's very unlikely if you're sampling in, that, in, in these time series, it's really unlikely you're going to see an improvement. If you're just taking a random sample, you're far more likely to find the system getting worse than getting better. And so I think like the shelling system, the, the niblet and the jurisprudence are both right. It's just that they're measuring things in different ways. Okay, I have five moving minutes. on, roger that. Um, I will get right to the point of example two. Um, example two is protecting a large venue from a coordinated suicide bombing attack. So we're shifting gears a smidge. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is a mixed resolution model that we used. We had sensors that you can see here, and we were able to model them at the, <laughs> down to the photon level. And in fact, if we jump ahead of slide, we've got math to prove it. So this was essentially how we modeled the, uh, the heat, you know, basically, you've got a body, you've got a bomb strapped to the body, then you've got clothes over the bomb, and I mean, we know all the physics, we know how the sensors work, that can be super high resolution. If we go on another slide, we also know the geometry and how geometry works. We can put the sensors in very specific locations, and they can have very specific probabilities of detection, things like that. However, you know, we didn't have the CONOPS for the bad guys down to this level of resolution. So essentially what we used was a, a Bayesian network for their decision making. And as they would get closer to the turnstiles, they would do their best to stay behind other people and stay out of the you know, line of sight of the police officers and things like that. And if they got really trapped and scared, they would blow themselves up at some inopportune moment rather than inside the sporting venue. And so what we did, if we jump ahead three slides to slide 49, we did my you know, favorite thing. We, we used a prototype. We built a lot of things so that we could explore the space. Perfect. Uh, until we figured out what, what mattered and what didn't. Then we ported it into Repast so we could run it on some big iron. We ran it a bunch of times. We did a bunch of analytics on it, figured out that some sensor configurations just always worked better than others. And so then we used that to do a human in the loop validation experiment at a mid-tier hockey arena somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, things actually went reasonably well with that. And so that's where we're able to mix the resolution. But again, remember, don't overdrive your results. Just because you've got sensors down to the photon doesn't mean your decision model for the bad guys is that good. And so you got to do parameter sweeps across all that stuff. See what are general classes of outcome. Some might be better than others. And then, you, you know, in this particular case, we're able to go out in the field and test it, which was nice and rather unusual, quite honestly. So just to conclude, uh, we're, as a community, you know, we're the experts here. And the current consumers really aren't from, from an application perspective. And so, you know, lots of people understand t-tests and normal distributions and things like that. But unfortunately, these are things that we typically don't run across in computational social science. I mean, humans are messy. The distributions are not normal. The test statistics are not t-tests. They're, you know, non-parametric and things like that. Or we're not even doing statistics in that sense anymore. We're doing you know, we're doing machine learning and things across these vast data sets that we've got. We have to hold our own feet to the fire and make sure we're doing the best we can and that, you know, we've got everything buttoned up and have done, done it right. And so I also think, and this is what makes the Computational Social Science Society of the Americas so exciting and so useful, in my opinion, um, is that we need to work together to develop these ideas and articulate what best practices should be so that we can have some standards against which to work, and so that folks that aren't experts in this can get a sense of what questions they need to ask 
and and that sort of thing. And so uh, with, with that with that message and just saying thank you again for joining us, I really hope this was at least not boring. Um, and please do send us feedback. I guarantee, well, I, I should say again, I'm not throwing everyone under the bus. I know I could do better. So please uh, let us know what Matt needs to do better. Um, and I also will not be the speaker next time. Uh, someone else will get that honor. Um, thank you very much. And again, uh, this will be the first Wednesday of July, what is it, May, June, July. That's how a calendar works. Uh, thank you again. Um, Andy, I will uh, turn things over to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we had uh, quite a few questions that, that came up in the chat while you were talking. Uh, one of the ones that came up was, I thought it was quite interesting. Could you explain what you mean by abductive research or abductive uh, theory? Sure. It, 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 it's, I, I won't claim that it's super well defined, but essentially that's trying to say there, there are two statements you can make about the real world. And uh, what, what is the third piece of information you need to make those two statements Co both coherent about the real world. So essentially the two statements are taken together, they, they paint a, an incoherent picture of the real world. So we want to live in integrated neighborhoods, but we don't. Um, what third piece of information do you need to make those two statements coherent again? And so in the Schelling case, it's, well, people are not coordinating their movements, and so even slight preferences will cause the system to become more segregated. We thought that that's how I think about abduction. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the other question that came up was there was a lot of debate about cars. Um, unfortunately, you picked on the <laughs> yeah. example. So there's the debate about whether or not, um, uh, you know, could you talk more about the fact that, you know, you can look at, depending on how you look at a car, it can be a com complex system. But if you look at it a different way, it could be a complicated system. Um, I mean, did you want to slightly address that at all, Matt? <laughs> Sure. I, I, I think we're in a, a, a transition phase. So um, back when I learned to drive, <laughs> cars were a lot less complicated. And, um, and, and at, at which point I think, you know, they really are complicated, um, not complex. They, they, you know, you pressed on the brakes, that increased the pressure in the lines, that caused friction against the wheels and the car slowed down, um, you know, dissipated the, the kinetic energy as heat. Um, nowadays, I think we're, we're, we're very close to being able to just say that car there, whether there's a human in it or not, is a complex system. And that'll be caused by, you know, basically the, the cars having more, more ability to make decisions on, on their own. And especially once we push this further out and cars can essentially communicate with each other to say, you know, dude, I'm in a real hurry here and you're slow poking it in the fast lane. Do you mind getting the hell out of the way so I can get past you? And once cars can start doing that, then uh, you know, then yeah, I, I I totally I wouldn't argue at all that, that we've now created yet another complex system with its own set of foibles. Cool. Um, does anybody else want to? Uh, I'm just mentioning here. Um, does anybody else want to jump in? You can unmute your mic. You should be able to. If you can't, let me know. Um, if, no, sir. Uh, yeah, it's Milton here. Can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, one of the interesting things on that car system, so cars as part of larger system, I think that's kind of that's your partial answer, that cars are becoming more integrated with each other, so the relational density is increasing, their interaction potential, all of that. And one yep. paper from uh, last year I thought that was pretty interesting at CSS was, uh, you know, from a public policy standpoint, the question of whether we have an obligation to optimize cars uh, moving through a city for the individual or whether we need to optimize the whole system. So if it's just for me, the, the thing is get me to my spot the fastest way possible. If it's a system optimization, it says uh, route me in such a way that the whole system is best used. In other words, the cars are perhaps most evenly distributed across the capacity of the system. If it's just optimized for me, it'll create a bottleneck and we'll end up with you know very high use, more direct routes, et cetera, traffic jams. But, but that's a case where I think from a modeling policy standpoint, it again depends on the parameter you choose to optimize 
uh, you know, how the system behaves and the kind of features, um, you know, that might end up being important uh, in terms of practical applications of what things to adjust. So you could have a policy that says, we're going to optimize for the system, like the whole roadway system. We're not going to allow you to optimize Uber or whoever for direct route. You're going to have to optimize to make best use of the whole system. But I'd be interested in your sense about, uh, Matt, from the things you've presented in terms of, you know, choosing which parameters to kind of uh, optimize around. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It, well, in fact, there's been some work on that. You know, so essentially, that's kind of what we're doing now with GPS is we're optimizing for the individual. And uh, what's interesting is that has caused some correlations in movement patterns. And so that there's uh, some work, I don't remember where it came, uh, I know that Sam Scarpino is one of the authors, um, that basically said, you know, for, from a systems perspective, the optimal is only about 70% adoption of GPS. And you need that other 30% to try something essentially random, or you end up with these very strong correlative structures across a city that creates, just as you said, lots of traffic jams and problems. And so it is very interesting. I mean, right now we're, we're pretty firmly in the, I'm optimizing for myself, the rest of you can all pound sand kind of camp. And um, I, I would not at all be surprised if that needs to change to actually make it make it work better for everybody, so to speak. You know, essentially, it's you know, kind of a prisoner's dilemma kind of thing. If you, if someone could come in and smack your knuckles every time you um, defected, uh, maybe we can make the whole system better. <laughs> any any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, anything, anything at all? Going once, going twice. Okay, so we're a little over time. Probably we should go ahead and quit. Uh, please do uh, email us. Let us know. Do these need to be longer? You know, do, do we need to have an hour of, of some creative lunatic talking and then 30 minutes of comments? Or should we make sure that the crazed lunatic only gets 20 minutes of talking and then we can have 40 minutes of discussion and still make it just an hour? Uh, please let us know. Any There are no bad thoughts or ideas here. We want these things to be useful to you. We are a society. Um, and so, you know, the board is here to make things better for you. So tell us what you need. Okay, um, there was, thank Matt, you very much again. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. There, was, there was a request to share your slides. Is that at all possible? Um, yes, it is. I will figure out, we will figure out a good way to do that and let everyone know where they are. They're, they're because of all these idiot pictures, they're kind of big and so the occasionally email systems don't like them. Uh, so we'll, we'll put them someplace and then point, point people to them. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was fantastic. I, I believe. I had a blast listening to myself talk, and I hope it was at least not, not boring for everybody else. Uh, have a wonderful Wednesday, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next webinar, uh, the first Wednesday of July, and also at the CSSA meeting uh, this fall, um, October 20-something at the Drury. The call for papers is out, so don't forget. It's our 10-year anniversary also, by the way, so the conference is going to be extra special. Surprises await. Hey, hey, you. Hi, Matt. One more question. Yes. How can a human irrationality be modeled, in your opinion? Ah, um, so yeah, <laughs> that is a loaded question. Yes, it's a big um, question. I, so I, I think that there are a number of ways you could do it. Um, I mean, you could define uh, a, a typical sort of utility function and then just start goofing around with uh, how things are weighted uh, so that it, it may appear as though the agent is making an irrational decision, i.e. something that would be unusual for a selfish maximizer to do. Um, that would be one way to do it. So they're still actually maximizing a utility function. It's just an unusual utility function. Um, alternatively, uh, another way that, that I've done it occasionally is just essentially 
given you know sort of randomly every now and then you make an agent just do something totally off the wall and and kind of ridiculous uh so that that also can help uh with that as well it i i find that it, that it's very contextual because what counts as irrationality depends on you know sort of what's going on around you and so it 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 depends exactly on um basically where the agent is situated at least that's been my experience Thank you very much. Sure. Any any other questions? I'm I'm perfectly happy to continue chatting, but I also don't want to, you know, drive people crazy. Cool. Uh, should we just call it a day, uh, Matt? And then, because uh, we've got a lot of good suggestions coming in for different formats for the next time, and then about allowing people to chat more. And we've got the new technology we could potentially use as well. So uh, I would suggest yep. the next time we come up with, uh, you know, have a bit more discussional points, and uh, just thank everybody for their time now, and uh, um, and call it a day. That sounds perfect. Thank you again, everybody. Um, I'm very happy that so many people showed up and um, I'm looking very forward to the next one. And I hope to see everybody in Santa Fe this fall. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, Matt. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you again. <laughs>